Right now, we are going to study about one very important aspect about the life of the Prophet Moses that set him apart from all other prophets. Moses' prayer life. That is a very important aspect about his life. What endeared him very dearly to God and also King David. Why God called King David the man after my own heart? Because he was a worshipper. We all think it's because King David was a worshipper. But if you look at the majority of the 150 Psalms that King David himself wrote, most of all the Psalms are prayer, right? They are prayer. It's a prayer that he turns it into a song of worship singing unto God. So which means King David, besides being a worshiper, was a great man of prayer. Was a great man of prayer whose heart was always to dwell in the temple. Psalms 27 verse 4. He says, that's one, one, my one desire that I can stay in your house all the days of my life. Just to stay in your house. Come and just sit there. No need to do anything. You just come and you just sit in the house of God and you say this. Now all this I learned from my intimate walk with God. Besides you opening your mouth and talking many, many words in prayer or in communion, God enjoys more your silent company than anything else. Just come and sit there and say, Lord, I have come to keep you company. That's what Psalms 27 4 says. I want to sit in your house. You know what Samuel used to do? Little Samuel, when he was still young, he always sleeps in the most holy place. That's why he was sleeping. He was keeping company with God. Why he was such a great prophet of God? From small, he learned to dwell in the holy place of God. That's why he was always sleeping in the most holy place. Technically, that's not allowed because the only the high priest can go in there. But here was this prophet called chosen by God. And he was always abiding in the most holy place. So no need to talk anything. Just come and sit in the presence. I have come, Lord, to keep you company. I have some free time. Don't waste time watching movies or television programs. Just sit there, keep the Lord company. You can read a book. And then every now and then you turn to the Lord and say, you know, Lord, this is funny. What kind of a statement they have written? This is what I do, you know. I, I shall. Or sometimes when I'm reading the newspaper, I say, Lord, look at this. Written accident. <laughs> ah, you all are so serious, you didn't catch it. So keep the Lord company. Learn to do that in your life. And initially, you may find it difficult now how to just keep still because like I told you we are people who are so used to activity that is why we can't learn how to wait on God but over a period of time if you learn you can still yourself and just simply still be quiet for hours and I tell you another secret you do this day by day day by day day by day every day or if not every day, at least consistently, one fine day, as you are sitting there, the Lord will come and sit by your side. And he said, I have come to keep you company too. The moment that happens, a new vista of friendship opens up. So you have to take the first step. The Bible says, no, draw near to God, and then he will draw near to you. 
So it's your responsibility to take the first step. And the prophet Moses had a great life of prayer. That's one thing that set him apart. So this is the word of the Lord that came when he gave me this teaching about Moses' prayer life. The last day's prophetic generation must be a people who will seek God as Moses did. You must learn how to seek God. So that's why we are going to learn now about his prayer life. Number one, Moses is a man who always sought God. Or in other words, he was a seeker after God. He was constantly seeking after God. Now if you read Exodus chapter 19 verse 3. Let's look at Exodus chapter 19 verse 3. Turn your Bibles with me. If you have old-fashioned Bible, or if you have a digital Bible, just swipe. Swipe them. Exodus 19 verse 3, and this is what it says. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now look at the first part of the scripture. And Moses went up to God. Now because Moses went up to seek God. The second part says. And the Lord called to him from the mountain. So this shows one thing about the heart attitude of Moses. He was a seeker after God. So you must take the first initiative. You want God to talk to you. You must talk to God first. If you don't talk to God, how can he talk to you? So you must do the talking first. You want God to show his face to you. You first show your face to God. You must show your face. You must say, come and say, Lord, look at me. <laughs> I have come to show my face to you. See, I am candidly sharing with you my life experiences, I, what I have learned. When it comes to God, you just behave like a child. You know, little children have childish foolishness, no? It's okay. Be childish before God. And he gets thrilled by that. See, he's our father, right? He's our father. And you are his child. So if you're a child, behave like a child. Our problem is we always behave like adults. That's the problem. When it comes to God, be like a child. So I'll say, Lord, look at my face. See how sad I am. You know, this is the first time I'm ever sharing all these private secrets. <laughs> Say, look at me, Lord, how sad. <laughs> Can't you show some pity? Then he will look down, poor fella. <laughs> Let me do something for him. <laughs> See, be childish before your father. You can't be like that to anybody else. He's your papa in heaven, no? Right? That's what God told, the Lord Jesus taught us to call him. He said, your papa, your father in heaven, how will your child behave towards you? In the same manner, isn't it? That's how little children behave with their fathers. And the same way, forget about your age when you come to talk with God. Forget about your age, forget about your big, your collared elder. Throw away all those <laughs> Throw away all those colors, throw away all the titles. You are a child. Amen. You are a child. So come before God like a child. Say, Papa, here I am. That was the attitude of Moses. If you read the book of Exodus, that was exactly how the prophet Moses behaved. So much so, one day the Lord came to him, why are you always crying all the time? Come on, keep quiet. 
I was very shocked when I first read that, you know. So, my God, look at this man. The Lord is asking, why are you always crying? Here, put a pacifier. You will be shock, shockingly surprised how human the Lord also can behave, you know. You will be shockingly surprised. So Moses was a man of God. A great man, but a man of great humility. Always sought God. And even if you read Exodus chapter 3 verse 1, it was he who took the first initiative even when he was tending after his father-in-law's sheep he stirred himself to seek after god and because of that the first encounter that he had the angel who appeared unto him in the burning bush that was the first time the angel appeared to him he never saw the angel but after that experience, that same angel visited him many times. He used, the angel used to talk to him, and he would see the angel, feel the presence of the angel, and the angel constantly also drove him to seek after God. Seeking after God. You know, every true encounter from heaven whether you have a visitation from an angel of God, or you have a visitation from a saint from heaven, I have learned from my experience in this last 38 years, or no, 35 years, because I only had all these spiritual experience, I began having them from the year 1984. So 34 years. Every encounter I had has always driven me closer to God, never away from it. Every angelic encounter I had, they've always magnified God. And they've always said, seek God, worship God. Or every heavenly, saintly encounter that I had, they, they've come, they come just like an angel, you know, sent by God to bring a message. They always end up saying, give all the glory to God. He's worthy of to be praised. That is what a true encounter does. If this test does not, is not present in your experience, then it's not from God. It will drive you. You know, there's another third factor. The third factor is, it will also create in you humility. Humility. True encounters from heaven will make you feel how zero you are. You know, you'll, you'll realize you are a big fat zero. And you will realize there's so much of pride in you that you must humble yourself more and crucify yourself more and seek after God. That's what true heavenly encounters will always produce. If this produces, then you truly had an encounter. But if the reverse happens in you, you become very prideful, you become very arrogant, you become very exclusive, something is wrong with your experience. Something is wrong. If no servant heart in you, you become very arrogant, very exclusive. Oh, God said this to me. You become very unteachable. These are all warning signs. Stay away. Stay away either from that person or stay away from those encounters you are having. Just reject them outright. Every true encounter will break you. Just like what it did for the biblical saints. Moses had an encounter and he was broken down. Isaiah had an encounter and he broken down and he repented and he cried. Saul, before he became Paul, he had an encounter, he fell down and he repented. This is what a true heavenly encounter will do. It will bring out the fruit of the Spirit in your life. If it doesn't bring out the fruit of the Spirit, something is wrong. 
If you become so puffed up with pride, with your little meager spiritual experiences, of course, immature people can do that, you know. They, they will be correctable. But if you have an uncorrectable, unteachable heart or spirit, something is wrong. Stay far away from such people. Number two, after the initial touch that he got from God, at the Mount Sinai experience, the burning bush experience, Moses constantly sought God. It became like a burning compulsion in him, like there was a drive in him to constantly seek God. Now, whenever you read in the Bible that God spoke with Moses, those were the times when he came to seek God first. It was he who took the initiative. He come to seek God. Lord, what shall we do this? What shall we do about this problem? What shall we do about that problem? And then God, and then you will read in the scripture, and the Lord spoke to Moses. And the Lord spoke to Moses. Those were the times when he always sought God first. The remarkable thing about the life of Moses is this. He was a waiter on God, meaning he mastered the art of waiting on God. There are so many Bible heroes who practice waiting on God. Among them, I find that Moses stands a class apart, where you really can see the art of waiting on God from his life. He waited for God to speak to him and reveal to him. And uh, in Exodus chapter 24, verses 13 to 16, he was called by God. He said, come and wait on the mount. I want to speak with you. So he climbed up the mountain and he waited there for six long days. Now, how many of us will do that? So God calls you to come, I, I want to talk, talk with you, come and wait. So you go and you wait. You look at your watch. After 30 seconds, you look at your watch. Oh, so late already. 30 seconds is very late already. Okay, 30 seconds, very late. Then you wait again. After 15 seconds, oh, 45 seconds, so late. How to wait any longer? So you say goodbye and you walk away. Most of us will do that, you know. Or if you don't, if you, uh, you have a greater patience, maybe not 45 seconds, three minutes. But look at this prophet Moses. He waited for six days, six continuous days. And the other factor is this, you know. He did not come down from Mount Sinai. He went up and he stayed there. Day and night. I wondered, you know, why did he do that? When I first read that, I wondered, why did he do that? Why didn't he come down? Because if I imagine, if I was him, I would have gone there, okay, now the sun is going to set. Okay, let me come down and then sleep in the house and then go up again in the morning. I would have done that. But why didn't Moses come down? What he did, he just waited there. And then I found the answer a few verses before that. God told him, come up and wait there. Just one word, wait there. So because God said, wait there, he was obedient to that command. God didn't say, come down a little while later, wait there. Now, this is a very, very important factor when you want to walk with God. Obedience. Obedience. You obey whatever he tells you to do. In the little things you obey him, that will endear him to you. And then it builds a stronger bond between you and him. 
and your relationship will grow and be strengthened because the Lord will find you faithful. Faithful because you are willing to obey. His soul, while he was waiting on the mount, longed for God. Not only he waited, but his heart and his soul was longing, when will the Lord come? When will the Lord come? What will he speak? He was constantly pondering, constantly meditating with great expectation for what is going to come. So this is something, some of the principles of waiting on God. Though you don't just simply sit and wait with an emptiness. Your heart and soul is longing with anticipation. Just like you would wait for your lover to come, your girlfriend or your boyfriend. While they're coming, you, when is he going to come? When are they going to come? Okay, what shall I talk when they come? What shall I talk? What shall I buy? Where shall I bring them to this restaurant or that restaurant? Are you, what rose shall I buy? Green rose, black rose, red rose, what rose? <laughs> See, your heart is pondering how to please your lover. In the same manner, your heart should be filled with a longing, anticipation, waiting for the lover of your soul to come. While he was waiting, the third aspect was, he was a worshipper. He worshipped God. How do we know that he was just a, was a worshipper? Because in Exodus chapter 15, you will read that when Miriam took the tambourine in her hand and she began to sing and dance, the whole of Israel all joined together to sing unto God. And not only that, in Revelation chapter 14 and 15, you'll read that there is a song of Moses that no one knows except a select group. So in order for someone to for a song to be dedicated to their name, they must be a great singer, right? So Moses was a great worshipper. A person like me will never have this ability. I have a great anointing for singing. You know, when I sing, no keyboard player can find the key on the <laughs> keyboard. They can never find. Because the special key that I sing, which is of heaven, is not found here. <laughs> It is the 105th key, which is not found in this keyboard. So I'm disqualified. <laughs> Song, so Moses was a worshiper. And the fourth aspect about his waiting on God, he opened his heart and he talks with God like a friend. In Exodus chapter 33 verse 11, you will read where it says, God spoke with Moses face to face as a friend would talk with a friend. Before God would do that, Moses took the first initiative. He first talked with God like a friend. You know, when two friends meet, they talk everything under the sun. Even, not even under the sun, above the sun, below the sun, left side, right side, all over the sun, even they'll go into outer space further beyond this galaxy, they talk about that galaxy, everything. No secrets between friends. Am I right, everybody? No secrets. That's how you should walk with God. Talk with God. Don't keep any secrets. Talk to Him everything. Just imagine Him to be just seated beside you. Of course, monologue is difficult, you know. But, you can train yourself. Before too long, you'll find the Lord Jesus seated right there beside you. And he will answer you back. And then a monologue will become a dialogue. A lifelong relationship, it will become like that. So remember always this one golden rule. You must take the first initiative. This is the golden rule. You take the first step of drawing close to God drawing nearer to God. You take the first step. The Lord God has done everything that he needs to do 
for you to come into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. He has already done that. He has given you his blood. Now with the blood, you come. You come. So he's waiting for you in the most holy place. He's waiting there when you will come. And when you come, the first question, I'll, I'll promise you what he will ask you. When you come, you meet him, the first question will ask you, why so late? <laughs> why so late? I've been waiting here for a long, long time for you. This is not laughing madam, this is real. Real. Why so late? Why so late? You know, I have kept some set times in my life for prayer. In the early mornings and in the afternoons and the evenings. So, before this conference, I was quite busy preparing all these messages. And I had to put them all in a sequential order so that when I'm communicating to you, you can see a pattern of flowing from point one to point 15, not jumping here and there. So in the midst of doing all that, I missed two days of going to pray at the afternoon set time. So by, I used to feel a little guilty you now, but I'll kneel down and pray, Lord, I need to prepare these messages. So today, if you don't mind, can I take this time to do these messages? So when I don't hear anything, we always are taught to think, means okay. So, <laughs> so okay. So after finishing all that, and uh, on the second day, I finished preparing all the message, and there was, I looked at my clock. According to the, the times that I've said, there was another 30 minutes remaining in the time that I could have spent there. So I decided to go, and I knelt down in my living room. As soon as I stepped into the living room, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ seated on the sofa where he usually sits when we meet for prayer. And the first question or the first thing he said to me was, I've been waiting here since three o'clock. You didn't come. I, how can I kneel? I fall prostrate and have to repent before God. You know, even though you were, I was not doing any worldly work, even though it was just ministry work, even then, a ministry work should not become an idol. It should never come between God and you. God should always be God. See, when you, when you reach a place where you are abiding in the most holy place, then God becomes a jealous God. Just like jealous husband, jealous wife, jealous boyfriend, jealous girlfriend, jealous God. Because you are mine. When you are mine, I cannot share you with anybody. So, he poured out his heart to seek what God's will for Israel is. He poured out his heart. His main objective now is, what shall I do with Israel? What is my role? What is my call? What is my purpose? So he'll constantly go and praise unto God for Israel. He never prayed for his own family. He never does that. You know, that is a secret I now teach you. You take care of God's business, God takes care of your family. You take care of God's business. You be very faithful taking care of his work and he will take after, look after your family. In 1983, when I stepped into full-time ministry, I always had a nagging guilt inside me that I have failed in my filial responsibility of caring for my aged parents because I was the oldest son. So it's my duty to take care of the parents, you know. So when I went into the ministry, I was always feeling guilty in my heart that I have failed. I have no money to provide for my family. 
to give any money to my father and mother because when you live by faith, I myself don't know where my next meal was coming from. So how to give them something? So couldn't, but the guilt was inside me all the while. But although I know that it was God who called me to the full-time ministry, so the guilt would not go away from me. And I never made it a prayer too. And uh, I fasted for 40 days the first time in January 1984. One day, the Lord Jesus appeared to me and he looked deep into my heart and he said, you take care of my work and I will take care of your family. From this day, don't worry about your family anymore. It was I who called you to resign your work and come and serve me. And I will take care of your family. The moment the Lord spoke that, that guilt left me. And from that day till today, my mother, can have, my mother have always has tons of testimonies. Those from Jesus, my King Church, you all know that too well. She never fails to share a testimony. She can write too many volumes that even the world cannot fill. <laughs> you know, God supplies all their needs as if I would have worked and given them money. Miraculous, miraculous ways God supplies their needs. And my mother knows how to blackmail God, you know. <laughs> ah, this is one secret, another secret for mothers. You, if you are a mother here who have given your son or sons or children to the Lord's ministry, as a result, you suffer financial loss. Then you can use this blackmail. <laughs> so, this is what she does. One day, well, this happened 30 years ago. I bought her a washing machine for Mother's Day because she just had a womb surgery, so she cannot wash by hand anymore. So I bought her this washing machine, and after a few years, you know, machines, you know, they suffer wear and tear. So the machine broke down. And the machine broke down mainly because of my brother's fault. <laughs> ah, his fault. Why his fault was because he had, didn't empty all his uh, clothes, the pockets from his clothes, and there were some coins in his pocket. And when the, my mother didn't realize it, she put the, her, his jeans into the washing machine, and the coins came and they fell into the tumbler, the spinner. And the coin went and got it stuck with the spinner. So the spinner will not spin at all. And she got a mechanic to come and repair, and the mechanic was going to charge a bomb. And she didn't have money for, to pay the mechanic. So she said, okay, I'll try to wash by hand. And she, each time she will sit down to wash, she will feel the pain on her womb. So she couldn't. So she thought for a while, what shall I do? She said, okay, let me pray. She knelt down, she put her hand on the washing machine, and she prayed. This is how she prayed. Listen, okay, this is secret, huh? Mm. But this is not secret, this is blackmail. <laughs> and this is how she prayed. She said, Lord, you know, I have two sons. If those boys had gone for work, they would have given me money, and I would be able to pay the mechanic. Now those two boys have gone to serve you, and they don't give me any money. <laughs> Therefore, you have to repair this washing machine. <laughs> That's all she prayed, you know? And she went and on the button, and all the coins came out of the spinner. <laughs> Every one of them came out. And it worked for a few more years. See? Blackmail prayer. <laughs> but the principle is this. It's not so much blackmail prayer, you know. It's the covenant God made with me in 1984. You serve me, I will take care of your family. And that's exactly what Moses, Moses did, you know. He has a wife, he had two sons, 
but he sent them back to Midian and he gave himself unreservedly, unconditionally to God to serve him, unconditionally. And he never prayed about them at all. His heart was constantly about the call that God gave him, the responsibility that God gave him, the church that God gave him. All his heart, all his money is for the nation, praying for Korea, praying for Japan, praying for Singapore, praying for all the nations who are gathered here. Your heart is consumed with a burden. When you do that, God will make sure none of your family suffers. None. Your sons, that's why the scripture says, no, all your children will be taught by the Lord. Because the parents are too busy. Now, don't use this as an excuse for all parents to always run after ministry and then don't take care of your children. No, no, no. You should not misuse this either. This is rare cases, no? You're busy there and God takes it upon his responsibility to teach all your children to walk in the ways of God. The fifth aspect about Moses, prayer life. He did not hurry or rush God in prayer. Now this is something we can learn, we should learn. Because we always rush God in prayer. Lord, please answer me within two days. Please answer me within one week. I'm sure if I ask how many of you are guilty, many of you will put up your hands. He did not rush God or he did not hurry God. But he waited patiently for God as a servant would wait patiently for his master. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1. Every morning before the sun rises up, early in the morning, Habakkuk will climb up the tower go right to the top of the tower and he stands there and he looks up at the sky. Just stand still. And he says, I wait to hear what God will speak to me. Wait. Waiting patiently. Because he is the master, you know. Always, please always remember, God is king. He is a loving friend. The way I portray to you, He's a loving God, a, a very friendly God who can condescend down to our level. He will do all that. At the same time, he is king. You don't forget that. Just because he humbles himself right down does not mean you should forget who he is. Keep always that attitude in your heart. Even though he's sitting beside you like a friend, the person sitting beside you is the king of kings and the lord of lords. We must never ever forget that. So wait without rushing. Luke chapter 12, verses 36 to 37. And the sixth aspect about Moses' prayer life. While waiting for God, you abandon yourself to God. You totally abandon yourself. When we say abandon means it's surrender. You totally surrender to the greater one. You abandon. Which means, abandon also means you totally commit yourself blindly to a person whom you can implicitly trust. That you know beyond all shadow of doubt, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, you can trust him wholesale. No matter what, he is worthy of trust. That is the concept of abandoning. Now, what is the result of all that? Three things. Number one, he had an intimate relationship with God. 
Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 10 says there was no other prophet like Moses whom God knew face to face no other person no this word was spoken in the this is the last scripture in the book of Deuteronomy before Deuteronomy there is the book of Genesis in Genesis there is Abraham there is uh, Jacob so many other heroes there but compared to everybody god says there's no one like moses whom i knew face to face intimate relationship number 2 intimate communion intimate talk intimate conversation exodus chapter 33 verse 11 God spoke with Moses as a friend would speak with another friend that speaks of intimate communion no more God talking to Moses as a prophet or God talking to Moses as a servant God spoke with him like a friend number 3 intimate privilege numbers chapter 12 verse 8 when there was an issue about who is the greater of the three of the family of prophets the lord personally came down to defend moses and and the lord spoke to miriam and aaron if there is a prophet among you i will talk to them through visions or dreams but my servant moses is not like that he is my friend say god himself came down to defend him you don't need any attorney no queen's counsel no any big name attorney god himself the great judge he he will represent you amen so these are the result of moses waiting on god number 4 he stood in god's presence the the fourth aspect of the life of moses the prayer life of moses he stood in the presence of god 40 days and 40 nights two times as a result of standing in the presence of god the bible tells us in exodus chapter 34 verses 29 to 35 that his face began to glow like the sun you know when when i first read the scripture it fascinated me how is it possible for a person's skin to glow with light no makeup no foundation no piling work no botox work <laughs> nothing no kind of toxin work but the face was glowing how is it possible and then in january 20th in the year 2000 i saw a vision in the vision i saw the prophet the saint moses in heaven this i was not caught up i just saw a vision and in the vision he explained to me how he had that experience he said my face reflected light and glory because I always beheld the pillar of fire. It was from the pillar of fire that God spoke to me. And the pillar of fire is a physical manifestation of the holiness of God. And because of that, the fires from the pillar of fire, you know, when you are standing very close to fire, the heat will be upon you. Sometimes the flames will jump up to touch you. have you experienced that just little sparks of fire will come so those fires will come upon him and those fires are the fires of holiness so it is the holiness that refined and purified him each time he commune with god and that experience when his face glowed was when he was there with god the second time 40 days and 40 nights when he was seeing the pillar of fire and god spoke to him 
in, at very close distance, not far away distance. See? And I want to say something to you right now. Every one of you here can have the same blessed experience. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. Each one of you here can have the same blessed experience. It is absolutely possible. If it's not possible, God wouldn't reveal all these things to us. Right? It would have been sealed, kept aside only for his personal thing. It was never been made public. It's made public because it is possible for all the children of God. But now, you know, you have an advantage that Moses didn't have. Do you know that? Yes or no? Yes. How? The blood of Jesus. So you have a better advantage, a better access directly into the most holy place because of the blood. See how better privileged you are. That is why I tell you with greater assurance and authority, you can definitely, every one of you, have this blessed experience. Amen. Because of the blood of Jesus. Because of the blood. The blood qualifies. The blood of Jesus has already paid the price. The blood of Jesus has torn the veil. And the blood of Jesus has made a way for you to come into the holies. If he has made the way, then the Father's face cannot be hidden to you anymore. Amen? Amen. Cannot be hidden. The veil has been removed. So that's why I said earlier, the day that you walk into the most holy place, the Lord will ask you, why so late? Why so late? I've been waiting for a long, long time. If you ask how long, you will say 2,000 years. <laughs> because that's when I died on the cross and rose again. I've been waiting for you. So, my advice to you, don't delay. Go quickly. Amen? Amen. Number five. Moses was an intercessor. Now, that's another great thing about him. He was a great intercessor. And the most beautiful part about his ministry of intercession is this, you know. He did not just simply pray for another person. He prayed for all those people who were persecuting him day and night. In Exodus chapter 32, verses 11 to 14, and in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, he prayed for the Israelites who were constantly complaining, constantly murmuring, constantly backbiting. And that shows us something, you know, his great shepherd heart. See, that's, that's the heart most pastors have. Even though the, the believers may step them, they will still pray for them with great love and great compassion. That's what a true pastor is. A man with great heart of love. They'll pray with great love. They'll pray with great compassion. So Moses was like that. He was an intercessor. Number six. He meditates on the words and the commands that God gives him. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Let not this book depart from your mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it day and night. So Moses himself practiced that. He meditated on the words that God spoke to him every day, every night. Psalms chapter 12 verse 6 tells us, there are seven dimensions to the word of God, which means... Besides the natural interpretation of a scripture, there are six different levels of spiritual meanings to every scripture in the Bible. Seven dimensions. And each one of the seven spirits of God can reveal to you each one dimension. 
Number seven. Now, all this while, the first six points, we saw the prophet Moses approaching unto God about his prayer life. Now, as a result of all that, point number seven brings us to now God's part. God talked. God instructed. God guided Moses with his voice. And that's exactly how God intends to speak with each and every one of his people. And that's the very purpose why God asked Moses to build the tabernacle. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, he says, from between the cherubim, I will speak to you. See, that's the purpose. God wants to speak with his people. God wants to dwell among his people. And the tabernacle of God is now within you. Luke chapter 17 verse 21 says, the kingdom of heaven is within you now. Your body, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 16, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So this body, within this body, the Lord abides in you and he wants to talk with you and move with you and come in with you. All takes place inside you. See, when you bypass this natural mind and when you come into a place of absolute stillness and quietness, when you're still and quiet waiting before God, now, this is an art that cannot be achieved overnight. But you need to practice it every day. And eventually you can master the art. And the art is, you must forget where you are. That you're not in this natural realm. Forget the natural realm. That's why you need to practice being still and quiet. It's difficult, I, I'm telling you from my own personal experience, it's difficult initially because we are so used to activity. The mind is like a monkey, doesn't stay in one place, always jumping here and there. And you will find one thing from your personal life that many times in our lives we forget many things. We forget what we did or what we put here, what we did. But the moment you sit in prayer, you suddenly remember everything. Have you experienced that? Yes. Suddenly you remember everything. Ayo, I now need to go do that. Suddenly you remember, so you stop praying, you go to do that job. <laughs> See, the devil also knows how to turn your memory on, turn your memory off. So when you want to come and talk with God, he turns your memory on. Ah, you remember. Or when you're reading the Bible, suddenly you remember. And then your mind drifts off into outer space. <laughs> Far away where even the USS Enterprise couldn't go. <laughs> so, because of all this, this mind must be pulled down. You know, once in my travel in Tibet, we were driving in the wilderness. And then I, I came across, we wanted to take a break. And we saw an American man. He brought a huge kite from America. He assembled the kite and he was flying the kite. There was a nice wind that was blowing. And this huge, gigantic kite flew in the Tibetan sky. So I stood in one corner. I was watching at this wonderful sight. And suddenly I heard the Holy Spirit speaking to me, say, what are you doing here? So... Now, I wasn't flying kite, so I, sh I couldn't say, Lord, I'm flying kite. <laughs> or go and fly kite. <laughs> so I said, Lord, I'm watching this person flying the kite. So, and the Lord asked me, okay, what do you see? So I said, Lord, I see this American man, and he has this nice, wonderful, big kite, and he's flying high up. So the Lord asked me, how is it possible for the kite to fly that high. So I said, the Lord, Lord, the wind carries the kite, and as a result, the kite is able to stay afloat. Oh, doesn't the kite fly away anywhere? 
I said, no, Lord, cannot, because the man is holding the kite with a string. And because of that, the kite only goes to a limited height and cannot go anywhere. <clears throat> After I had explained this, then the Holy Spirit told me, that's exactly what you must now learn to do. The kite represents your mind. It likes to fly everywhere. So now you must pull the kite down, control your mind, quiet your mind from flying anywhere. You can do it. It takes time. It takes some self-control. It takes some purposeful decision. No, I'm not going to think. I'm not going to think about anything. So don't let it go. Pull the kite down because the strings are in your hands. What is that string? It is your will. The string is your will. You can exercise your will. So use your will, pull it down. Pull the string down back and keep your mind quiet. That's step number one. Keep the mind quiet. Once the mind is still, now step two. Lose conscious of your physical realm. How do you do that? You must lose conscious now of the physical realm. You do that by now lifting your mind heavenwards. Think about God. That's why the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, set your affections on things that are above and not things on this earth. So the moment you lose consciousness of this earth and you begin to think heavenly thoughts, the next moment you are in the spiritual realm. You are aware of the realm of the spirit all around you. Now I say this simply in just a few minutes, but this is an art that you need to practice every day. And it is absolutely possible. It's not an impossible. It is possible to achieve, to live in two realms. You can live in the natural realm and you live in the heavenly realm at the same time. Two realm. And once you begin to live there, you'll, you'll find many other spiritual mysteries taking place at the same time, which at this moment may be premature for me to tell you all that. So first, the kindergarten stage. All right, once you all pass kindergarten, then we go to primary school. So the kindergarten is, first you control the monkey. Okay, first you learn to control the monkey and learn to, don't fly the kite, pull the kite down. This is first. When you come for the next Moses Conference 2, then we, go. <laughs> then we go to the next level. This is simple. This is whatever I'm sharing with you is basic Christianity. This is not advanced. Basic Christianity, which sadly the church has failed to teach. Sadly failed to teach. But before the Lord Jesus comes, this heritage will be restored back into the church. Amen? Amen? They will all be restored. That's why you are hearing all this now. Now, we have seen how we can talk to God. Now, number eight. Conditions for God to talk with a person. There are a few conditions. Particularly, five conditions. Condition number one which I already shared with you earlier, obedience. That's condition number one. Moses was obedient and faithful in all of God's house. Numbers chapter 12 verse 7 and Hebrews chapter 3 verse 2 and 5. He was faithful and truthful to all that God commanded him. Faithful and truthful. In the small things, little things, 
then God will promote you step by step, step by step into larger, wonderful things. You know, there's one wonderful young man in our midst from Australia. Pexi, please stand up for a moment now. Give a good clap to Pex. One thing remarkable about Pax is he's, he's a man always with a baseball cap. <laughs> now, Pax, uh, Pax is a wonderful uh, son-in-law of a very godly father-in-law and mother-in-law. He's so blessed to have a godly heritage. Did you realize that, Paxi? You are overly blessed with a godly heritage. Huh? A praying mother-in-law and a praying father-in-law. A, a pastor father-in-law. Wonderful people. So, and his wife is another great woman. God bless him with another great woman. See, you're so overly blessed. <laughs> now, this young man his parents are involved with our ministry for 20 years in Sydney. And I am triple blessed, more blessed than you, Pexi. <laughs> you know? And one day, several years ago, we were shooting a TV program in his house. And I was overseeing the whole production. This young man was seated in his living room. I cannot remember carefully the, the, the facts of that day, whether you just came into your house after work. But he was sitting in the living room, and I stood in the, near the kitchen, and uh, overseeing the camera work, and an angel of God walked to me and said, that man has a call of God on his life. And God has specially called him for the end times, to raise, to train the youths for the call. So I was very happy for him because his mother-in-law has been praying for him a lot, too much. <laughs> <laughs> so I called him aside. I said, Paxi, this is what I just heard. And the moment I spoke that to him, something inside him jumped up. And his eyes brightened up and he said, you know, I've been stirring in my heart towards that. You remember, Pexi, you said that? He had a stirring, he, God has already put something inside him. And there was a stirring inside him. And what I shared confirmed what he was already being stirred. You see, that shows that God had already prepared a man before that time came. So when the time came to step into their destiny, so God confirms that word. Okay, now the spark begins. So he began to pray. So I told him, you fast and you pray, and God will give you the plan, God will give you the strategies. And he fasted and he prayed, and then God began to give him strategies. How to design games. Have you watched the reality show called Survivor? Something like that, God gave him a game, game plan, game shows for youths. Survivor in the end times. Not just survivor, you go to a jungle, you stay in a desert, and then you, you backstep one another, and then you vote people out. This, you're not voting anybody out, we are saving people from the Antichrist. So he designs wonderful games, get the youths all involved, and prepare them, you know? So, being obedient and truthful to what God calls you to do. So number one, condition number one, obedience. Condition number two, faithful. Faithful to do what God commands. Exodus chapter 40, verse 16. He was absolutely faithful to do everything God told him. He that is faithful in the least 
will be rewarded with more. And the scriptures also says, when you are faithful in another man's ministry, God will give you your own ministry. First, you prove your faithfulness in another man's ministry. If you cannot be faithful in somebody else's ministry, don't ever say, God told me to start my own ministry. That is not God. That's your own flesh. You manufacture your own God. Because if you cannot be faithful in another man's ministry, how can you do another ministry? You cannot do. Because you did not prove your faithfulness. The Lord Jesus himself said all this. Number three, watchful. The eyes of Moses were always looking towards the tabernacle. Why? He was, his eyes were always there, watchful, waiting for God to call him, to meet with him anytime. So his eyes was always there. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Who is the wise servant? He who will always be waiting and watching when the master will come. So watchful, being watchful. When you are watchful and waiting, then God will come and talk with you. If you are sleeping all the time and God knocks on your door, you can't even hear because you're too sound asleep. Your house is soundproof. <laughs> Not your house, no, your ears are soundproof. You can't even hear anything. Number four, respectful. Moses was very, very respectful. He never delays meeting with God. Always punctual and respectful of God. I've already explained this to you in a, a few messages ago, how to be very punctual, respectful of the times that God gives you. You honor God. When you are respectful, it shows that you are honoring God. You do not despise Him. That you reverence Him. Number five. He was a communer. That means he was always talking to God about all matters and he discussed with God how to do all the matters of the ministry. He never did anything on his own. He never used his own human understanding. How to do, what to do. Now, this is something very remarkable about Moses' life, you know. Because the scriptures tells us in Acts chapter 7, and verse 55 to 58, that Moses was educated in all the wisdom and knowledge of Egypt. That's number one. And he was groomed in all the sciences, engineering, administrative know-how of running an empire like the Egyptian empire. For 40 years, he was trained. So for such a caliber man, how can he not know what to do, when to do? Right? Everybody agrees? But that was the old Moses. So during his 40 years sojourn in the wilderness, God, he took off everything of Egypt out of him. So all of Egypt went, disappeared. So now, the man who went to serve God is a new Moses. One who has totally emptied himself of everything. He allowed God to peel off every layer of the onion skin of his life, of his soul, of his spirit. Everything peel off. When everything is peel off, what remains? Nothing. You die. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ Jesus lives in me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. So as a result, 
he always goes and talks to god and discusses god and gets god's plan how to do everything even about the children's future even about your family don't use your own understanding how you're going to do which school to send which college to send who is going to be your children's life partners for the rest of their lives pray you pray is your parents responsibility because children sometimes can make foolish mistake choosing wrong life partner it's a parents responsibility to pray for your children's future that the person they they are going to marry will be the right person who have been predestined for their lives so that when they mesh together together husband and wife are serving god just like what joshua said you know as for me and my house we will serve the lord a family ministry right that's how it should be that's the pattern of god not just one person one one person serves god another person serves the devil you don't want that do you no so it's very important for the father and the mother to pray for their children you pray you pray ah now listen this is not secret this is just common sense when you pray for your children you must be careful not to pray witchcraft prayer very sadly many many christians some christians willfully pray witchcraft prayer but some christians unknowingly pray witchcraft prayer but whether knowingly or unknowingly witchcraft is witchcraft okay what is witchcraft prayer witchcraft prayer is praying your will for somebody else that is called witchcraft prayer for example let's say your daughter brings a boyfriend whom you don't like so you pray lord i don't like this person lord i pray you will bring this man out of my daughter's life ah that is wrong prayer that is witchcraft prayer because you are praying your will okay anyway so don't pray your will superimpose your will no pray lord i pray let your will be done in my daughter's life let your will be done in my son's life lord i pray if this be your will show us clearly lord open show us clearly see that's the right way to pray but i show you a better way the better way to pray for your children's future is when they are small then you start nurturing them don't pray after they are too old no after they brought a boyfriend pray before they bring anybody so pray when they are small or before they are even born in your womb put your hand on your womb pray lord i dedicate my womb to you let my womb bring forth kings let my womb bring forth prophets let my womb bring forth warriors for your end time kingdom pray that prayer this is what god taught me to pray no not for me you know <laughs> for me to tell you all this <laughs> so pray that prayer or when you are born lay your hands on your babies and dedicate them to god dedicate them lord i dedicate them to your will you gave me this baby as a gift it's not mine it's yours lord i'm just a custodian remember all parents must remember that you know you are a custodian you are not an owner of that child the child has been sent to this world and you are a caretaker that's all caretaker so you dedicate the child and then every day pray for the child to grow up in the ways of god to grow up in the fear of god and teach the child the things of god and how can he depart so in conclusion the last days prophetic generation must be a people who seek god 
Because great power is going to be revealed to them. Great power is going to be poured upon them. And a great anointing is going to be given to them. Daniel chapter 11 verse 32. It says, the people that do know their God shall do great exploits. You know, we have only heard of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit is very abundantly manifest in our churches for the most maybe 100, 200 years. But in the last days, God is going to do something else. He's going to pour the seven spirits of God. They are going to be poured. And when the seven spirits of God are poured, it will mix together with the nine gifts of the spirit. The glory of the latter house and the glory of the former house joined together as a great powerful tempest that will come upon the face of this world. 